Welcome to this presentation on geological settings of early earth. My name is Martin van Krenendonk. I'm from the University of New South Wales. And I've been mapping in early earth environments for over 30 years for most of my career. Um, in the very earliest earth history, of course, we have no geological record left. But the best modeling suggests that our planet would have been a single plate planet affected by stagnant lid tectonics whereby melting of the mantle was producing a, a thick crust. Parts of that may have dripped off by delamination, but no real sort of plate tectonics is envisaged for the very earliest history of the Earth. The oldest records of crustal materials that we have suggest that that, mafe, that early crust was mafic in composition. From Northwestern Canada and the Nouveau Agatuk Greenstone Belt, Detailed studies on isotopic systems suggest precursor materials back to as old as 4.2, 4.3 billion years ago. And that crustal component is mafic in composition. Now, of course, there may have been ultramafic rocks, but dominantly it looks like the melts from the mantle would have been basaltic. And if we think about the combination of that stagnant lid and basaltic crust, we would have had a situation much like some of the smaller rocky planets and moons that are now geologically dead, but that are covered by a single thick crust. And of course, with the accretion of solar system materials, there would have been a large amount of impacts. So very early Earth's crust could have looked something like this. And the implications there are when we think about the geological environments is to think about a condition before there were the oceans, before the atmosphere is rained out, this thick basaltic crust with impact basins. And as the hydrological cycle developed, as moisture started to condense, the steam atmosphere interacted with the crust, we could have developed a situation like we see on early Mars with lakes, rivers, deltas, and even perhaps some large seas. These are all examples from Mars. And if we think about what happens with that sort of uh, water rock interaction, we can generate a certain amount of mineral complexity. And there's a nice paper by Brian E. Horgan, for example, that's looking at the edge of Jezero Crater, where there's an enrichment of carbonates in all of the enriched rocks that could be the result of water rock interaction through dehydration and wetting drying cycles. So we can generate a certain amount of mineral complexity through this very early process. Now it gets more interesting if you start adding magmatic heat and you can do that in two different ways. From large impacts that have enough energy to penetrate down into the mantle, you can generate magmatic intrusions. There's a good example from early earth from the Sudbury igneous complex about 1.85 billion years old there's a thick layered igneous intrusion that was in place as a result of the impact below the ejecta that fell back, the fallback breccia in through here. This norite complex is made up of a thick sequence of igneous rocks. You can see it's five kilometers thick. And when that kind of heat starts interacting with surface environments, studies have shown that you can generate long lived hydrothermal systems. In the paper in 2004, they did some modeling of a of Sudbury size impact basin and showed that these um, high temperatures can last for extremely long periods of time. Here we have a model that extends to 2 million years. And these are not even some of the largest impacts that early Earth would have seen. So with that magmatic component, we get greater chemical and mineral complexity because there's addition of magmatic components, including volatiles, in, such as sulfur-rich gases. And there's an example from Iceland where we have dominantly basaltic crust. There are lots of hot springs in Iceland because of the volcanic heat interacting with water. And we get mineral assemblages in the alteration halo, such as, of course, enrichment of silica, but also anatase, GiO2, and clays, such as kaolinite and montmorillonite. And this is important when we start thinking about prebiotic chemistry, because a famous paper in 2005 by James Ferris shows that montmorillonite can catalyze the formation of RNA. This little diagram just shows the importance of that addition of the magmatic 
component in terms of changing the chemistry. Here's the composition of surface waters in terms of pH and the amount of chlorine. And you can see that the magmatic contribution is extremely different. And when you mix those, you can increase complexity and variability and generate these additional kinds of mineral assemblages. Now, you can also add that magmatic heat just by volcanism. And of course, we also know on early planetary bodies, there would have been an amazing amount of volcanism. Here's an example from Mars again, Olympus Mons, extremely high, biggest volcano in the solar system. Now, of course, that's very long lived, but on early Earth, there would have been volcanoes all over the place. And that addition of magmatic heat joined with the developing hydrological cycle would develop hot spring deposits. We know on early Mars, there are hot spring deposits as known from Nilipatera, for example, these bright white areas are opaline silica and same at um, Columbia Hills where Squires and others, Steve Ruff have shown that there are opaline silica deposits with all the hallmarks of hydrothermal systems. And so with that hot water rock interaction with a magmatic component, we generate a lot of complexity through that hydrothermal alteration. You develop clays, titanium dioxide, and other concentrated elements, and you can have the wet dry cycles that are interesting for polymerization. You can also generate complexity because on early systems, you can also generate felsic crust in three different ways. So one of the ways is that you can do it through internal differentiation. And this has been explained as the reason for um, the presence of these very ancient zircons from Jack Hills. It's a paper by Tony Kemp and others. There's another paper by Bonnecke and others that show that there was potassic high silica crust in the Hadean. Now, some have suggested that this was actually the, the presence of plate tectonics and continents formed, but pro more probably it was just internal differentiation of a thick mafic crust. The other way you can generate felsic crust in early systems is when you over thicken by magmatism and you start melting at the base of the crust. If we look at Iceland again, it's a thick um, piece of crust over a, a oceanic spreading center and a mantle plume. And melting at the base of that thick volcanic pile is generating tonalites, sodic granitoids that look very much like some of the most primitive Archean crust on Earth. And these are just some geochemical plots on the bottom left to show the similarity of those two. So melting of base of thickened crust will start to differentiate the crust and make these more felsic compositions. The third way you can show it, and this is a more recent paper just a couple of years ago by Tim Johnson and others, that show that by high impact melting, you can generate felsic crust as well. And they've modeled this for, in fact, some of the oldest rocks preserved on Earth. 4.02 billion year old Itawa gneiss from the Acasta gneiss complex in the Slave Craton in Northwestern Canada. So you can differentiate the crust and generate more complexity by making felsic components. Add it to that volatiles and you generate a wider assemblage of minerals and some concentrated elements which could be important for prebiotic chemistry. Of course, added to all of this is abundant incoming solar system material. Meteorites, interplanetary dust particles, they bring in a wide variety of materials as the building blocks for life, including a wide array of organic molecules, carbonates, hydrously altered silicates, lipids, water, ice, a whole variety of material is coming to the earth from outside. Now, of course, the volume is much greater in the early Earth, very early Earth, than it is today. So this would have been a major contributor. Studies on those ancient Jack Hill zircons suggest that the oceans had started to rain out by at least 4.2 billion years ago, maybe even a bit earlier. This is the isotopic record that Aaron Kevazi and others identified. Typically, zircons that derive from melts directly from the mantle have this very well constrained composition at about five to five and a half delta 18 O values. But they noticed that after 4.2, and maybe even some a little bit before, have this more enriched signature, which is an indication that the melts had interacted with water and altered the zircon. 
And so this was used to suggest that the oceans had certainly been present on Earth by 4.2, maybe even a little bit older. And once the oceans had fallen out, then you get a whole range of other environments to those that had been summarized before. If we look at the ancient geological record to give us a feeling for what kind of environments are, here's the history going from 4.2 up to about 3.2, so the early period of the Earth. The Jack Hill zircons go back to an astonishing 4.4 billion years old. The Nuvuagatuk agate material suggests there's a precursor at 4.2. The rocks are about 3.8. But well-preserved rocks don't really start to come into the rock record until about 3.8, 3.7 billion years ago in West Greenland. And that's right at the tail end of the heavy meteorite bombardment phase of planetary accretion. Even better preserved rocks are at about 3.5. And we're going to look at these two in terms of understanding environments that may have been present as nascent plate tectonics was going and crust was forming in two distinct ways. Over plumes, like in Iceland, and via this nascent plate tectonics horizontal accretion, more akin to a model like this shown here. So in West Greenland, there's a famous supercrustal belt, issue a supercrustal belt. Supercrustal means rocks that were deposited on the surface of the earth. So volcanic and sedimentary rocks. And studies there show that this little belt is actually made up of two distinct tectonic slices bound by this um, dashed red line or separated by this red line. One side of that belt has only rocks that are 3,700 million years old, 3.7 billion years old, including volcanic rocks and sediments intruded by these sodic granitoids, these primitive sodic granitoids that derive from melting of basalt. On the other side, everything is 3.8. Again, volcanic rocks and sediments, also a slice of the mantle intruded by 3.8 billion year old granitoids. Now these volcanic rocks have a distinctive signature in the rare earth element pattern that has this kind of boat shaped pattern. This is what is called bononite like. It's a type of volcanic rock that indicates the mantle had interacted with water. And this is one of the strong pieces of evidence that there was a subduction component going on already as far back as 3.7. And it's inferred that crust formed through horizontal invocation and melting to generate this kind of scenario. A very different type of crust formed at 3.5, so a little bit younger, and it's preserved in the Pilbara Craton. It's an area of large granitic domes and greenstones that wrap around. This is a radiometric heat map showing that very distinct difference. Detailed mapping through the volcanic stratigraphy shows an extremely thick succession, up to 21 kilometers thick. Oceanic crust today is eight kilometers thick. And it's all deposited on top of each other in layer after layer. We've got it really well dated and was deposited in these distinct groups, three distinct groups over a long period of time. Now these volcanic rocks have a very simple geochemistry. They've got relatively flat patterns that indicate their melts directly from the mantle, no subduction zone related contamination. And so this type of crust is sort of thought to have formed as a thick volcanic plateau, like, Ace, like Iceland, with the base starting to melt, generating the TTGs. So two very distinct types of crust early in Earth history. In the Ishua belt, there's a beautifully preserved sequence that is typical of a marine transgression. There's an older basaltic unit below at the very top of which is a very highly altered zone, very aluminous, lots of garnet. These are quite high metamorphic grade. But you can still see pillows preserved. You still get primary sedimentary textures. Immediately on top of that is a conglomerate, a polymict, meaning lots of different types of class conglomerate of material washed in from different sources on an unconformity. Overlying that then are dolomitic carbonates with structures that have been interpreted as stromatolites, cross-bedded sandstones, and banded iron formations. This is a deepening succession from shallow water, probably even coastline, to deep water banded iron formations. And exactly the same sequence is found in the Pilbara craton at about 3.4 billion years old. 
There, the Strelly Pool Formation is also deposited on an unconformity on older pillow basaltic rocks that have an alteration weathering profile, conglomerates, stromatolytic carbonates, cross-bedded sandstones, but instead of abandoned iron formations, we get pillow basalts, but it's still a deep water succession. So the inferred environment for this is you've got a shelf where there are carbonates being deposited that have stromatolites, and then you go into the deeper water and you get banded iron formations or pillow basalts, depending on the rate of extension. Now there is evidence for life in this at 3.7 and 3.5, so the stromatolites are one, but there's also evidence from the iron formations that they were precipitated because of the activity of anoxygenic photosynthetic microorganisms. A very different environment is preserved on that volcanic plateau in the Pilbara. At 3.5, there's the dresser formation, very well studied over a long period of time. Stromatolites were found there in 1980 and have been studied by many different groups, including our own over the last 30, almost 40 years now. So this area is characterized by thick sequences of chert barite sedimentary rocks. Within those are found stromatolites, but all of that succession is underlain by a sequence of very highly altered volcanic rocks that are transected by a dense network of hydrothermal chert, meaning just silica, and barite veins. This is a massive hydrothermal volcanic system that's preserved in almost perfect preservation, just slightly dipping so that you can see through the bottom to the top of the succession. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the time to describe a lot of the detail that is been um, studied from this area, but basically the environment is a shallow volcanic caldera setting with these hydrothermal veins cracking down to the, to the, to the foot wall where there was a magma chamber that was adding volatiles, creating this very widespread alteration zone of the volcanic rocks and depositing concentrated elements through evaporation and through hydrothermal concentration at the surface. Now we can see that there are clays developed in the foot wall here. We get kaolinite in through here, we get white mica, we get chlorite, we get a lot of interesting mineral chemistry and we get a lot of transfer of ions because of that hydrothermal circulation. The best analog that we have for that is from a uh, volcanic crater in um, Tonga. It's a little bit smaller. This is only about four kilometers in diameter. The North Pole, the Dresser Formation was about 25 kilometers. So it's a much bigger caldera, but it has islands. It's got an evaporating uh, volcanic lake and there's stromatolites that are growing on the margins, just like we see in the dresser formation. So that's one environment we have in the dresser, but what we've also recently found is evidence for an exposed land surface with hot springs. The PhD student Tara Jokic published this paper in 2017 already. She's got another one in press in astrobiology, but she discovered this little rock slice here. This is only a centimeter across, so it's quite small scale but it's got this very distinctive black and white lamination making these highly irregular botryoidal forms. Now, what we found is that here's the 3.5 billion year old rock textures. And here are textures from um, active hot spring systems on land. And they have exactly the same textures and mineralogy indicating that these rocks so long ago were formed by the action of a splashing geyser on an exposed land surface. And what's more, there's indications that these were inhabited by microbial communities. So the exciting thing about this is that we can make that analog back to that hot spring in Iceland that I talked about. We have the kaolinite, we have anatase, we have uh, this whole system that we can recognize in the modern analog with the same kind of mineralogy that was important for prebiotic chemistry, including montmorillonite in the modern setting, but kaolinite in the Iceland and in the ancient rocks. And so with this discovery, we have evidence now for the wet-dry cycling, that's what causes that fine-scale layering, 
and the development of mineralogy, which is interesting in terms of prebiotic chemistry. Moreover, we found that in the Dresser Formation, there are concentrations of many of the elements that are important for catalyzing um, reactions in prebiotic chemistry. We have concentrations of zinc, for example, titanium and anatase and potassium, but also many other of the trace elements, including boron. We've got a thin layer where there's a concentration of boron, and all of these have been identified as important for prebiotic chemistry. So not only carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, but these other trace elements required for prebiotic chemistry can be found in concentrated environments on land in the ancient rock record. And so these are just two examples that indicate the importance. Zinc has been identified as potentially extremely important by Armin Mokajanian. And borate has been identified by uh, Hugh Jong Kim and Steve Benner's group as being the most effective catalyst for making carbohydrates. So this is just some of the idea about some of the building blocks available for early life. Now, after about 3.2 billion years ago, that nascent form of plate tectonics had evolved into what we can recognize as actually modern style plate tectonics with steeply dipping plates, all the geochemistry that we can recognize of modern environments. And so we have a change from sort of shallow convection to much deeper convection and the movement of plates probably right down to the core mantle boundary and development of real continents by three billion years old. And in the rock record, after that time, we find a, a new environment at 3.24, the Sulphur Springs group is a sequence of volcanic rocks that overlie a large granite intrusion here, the Strelly Monza granite. And it was discovered in um, already 1995, a while ago, that textures related to the emplacement of that granite generated these beautiful circulation cells that caused alteration geochemistry and deposits of zinc, copper, and lead. These are some of the oldest, best preserved massive sulfide deposits. And importantly, it was identified by Sue Vernicombe and others that the textures of those sulfides had identical features as modern black smokers. And that there were, the sulfides were precipitated in open cavities from boiling fluids. And so these are 3.24 billion year old black smokers compared to modern black smokers here. And you can see this fine concentric lamination that's identical to the textures found long ago. And so this is a new environment preserved in the rock record. It may well have been present much earlier, but they also have been discoveries of filamentous microfossils in these ancient um, deposits. So it certainly was a habitat for life back 3.24 billion years ago, and potentially an important site for the origin of life uh, much earlier than that. So just to summarize then, I think that we can probably identify the very early history of the earth in sort of two components, pre-ocean world and um, post-ocean world. The pre-ocean world, perhaps greater than 4.2, maybe even a little bit older, would have been a highly impacted thick crust. And as the hydrosphere started to develop, there would have been hot rock water interactions, developing interesting alteration chemistry, on a relatively uniform crustal composition, made more complex by the generation of felsic crust through large impacts, um, through internal differentiation, and maybe also some ultramafic crust exposed. After the rain out of the oceans, we have a quite diverse range of environments that are available for um, developing complexity. And so it's interesting to think about the evolution of our planet in those terms, but I think one of the key take home messages is that even in the very earliest period of our Earth history, there were the environments that were able to generate mineral complexity through hot water rock interaction with magmatic additions that become interesting in terms of thinking about the origin of life. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present and I hope you give us gives you some information to think about uh, with all the other great talks that are being um, presented. Thank you very much.